Welcome to Doc Talk, a weekly podcast featuring Monument Health physicians addressing medical topics. Tune into your health with Monument Health. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me is Dr. Felicia Beltman, uh, an audiologist, doctor of audiology at Monument Health at the Spearfish Clinic. Thanks for coming back, doctor, and talking with Thank us you. again. I don't know why this has become so fascinating for me uh, over the past uh, few days I've been looking into this stuff. I think I know why, because my entire life has been, since I was 16 years old, I've been on the radio. And so I've always worn headphones, mm-hmm. and I've always listened to crappy 80s hair metal and 90s country too loud and i realize you gotta tell kids not to do that (laughs) at some point right um we want to talk about uh, pediatric hearing loss for this podcast and uh you know i think a, a good place to start is now with these kids and the the airpods that they have and the headphones that they use so much does that does that kind of get under your skin a little bit about how much that's used for kids in their hearing? Um, Not necessarily. It's more about how loud it is. Right. I I take more issue, I guess, with um, kids that are at hockey games that are at, you know, motor trucks, whatever those are. (laughs) The monster Uh, trucks. The monster trucks, yeah. yeah, (laughs) With no hearing protection. Okay. Um, Kids that go out shooting with their parents, no hearing protection. That I take more issue with that than I do probably with the music. Sure. Um, yes, we don't want kids listening to music loud all day long. Um, but for the most part, um, I think they're, they're probably okay. If it's, <laughs> if it's really loud, we, we do need to give them reminders to turn it down. Yeah. Um, keeping it, if you have like the bar where you can turn up the, mm-hmm. the volume, never have it more than about 60%. You just don't need it louder than that. Oh, um, okay. And you can, there are settings in like iPhones, I know for sure, that mm-hmm. you can go in and put parental controls on the volume. Right. And only have it go to a certain decibel level. And there, well, you're wearing an Apple Watch. Yep. I'm wearing one. And I know that they have uh, instruments in them now that tell you when it's too loud. Yeah. You're in a, an yep. environment that's too loud. When it gets, I think, loud. over 90 decibels is when that starts. Okay. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's a good way to start this. Is yeah. is, is, is It's common sense. Anywhere there's loud noises with your kids, you should have ear protection for them, correct? Correct. Um, so let's say they don't and they, they go about their, their, their lives through grade school and middle school. What are the primary causes for hearing loss in kids like that then? Is it kind of what you just described? So as far as hearing loss goes, the number one, there's kind of differences. So the, a congenital hearing loss is a hearing loss mm. someone is born with, mm-hmm. um, and there's different reasons for that. And then you'll have acquired hearing losses. Um, he, noise-induced hearing loss is just one of those acquired hearing losses that you can have in childhood. Um, other things would be from... Uh, like ototoxic medication if a for instance like if a baby has to go to the NICU or they're on some kind of medicine um, that can can damage their hair cells in the ear um, that would you would know about that the, your provider would have told you like you need your hearing checked okay um, there's other acquired hearing losses like meningitis meningitis is oh I suppose right there away. are illnesses yep, that do that illnesses. too then. Um, if you have meningitis we like to test right away and monitor you very closely for hearing loss. Okay. Um, Once so those are acquired. More congenital type hearing losses are going to be genetic hearing losses, um, differences in an anatomy. Really? Genetics can play a part in it. It oh, can yeah. be... Genetics, genetics is the number one cause of um, a congenital, congenital hearing loss. <laughs> oh. I, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I guess that's, again, something you wouldn't normally think about because it seems like that's so... You know, your hearing and your vision. I mean, your five senses, really. You, it, it, you don't you don't think that congenitally those could be damaged because of because of your genetics yep. and not not congenital, but your genetics. Um, huh. Well, here we go. I'm learning so much <laughs> now. I have so many more questions throughout this whole thing. Uh, but when hearing loss happens, it's it it can't really be. I mean, it, it doesn't repair itself. Correct? Is that is that Yes and no. Okay. So there's different types of hearing loss. So the first type that most people think about is what we call sensory neural hearing loss. That would be a hearing loss that's into the cochlea and then into the nerve. Um, that is a permanent hearing loss, um, whereas a conductive hearing loss is sound has trouble conducting through the ear. And that's where you'll see, um, like, when kids get tubes. 
You'll oh, hear all kinds of yep, kids get tubes. Right. There's fluid sitting behind that eardrum, typically, and if we can get the fluid out, we can correct that conductive hearing loss. So conductive hearing losses do have the potential to be corrected. Not everyone can, but they have the potential to be corrected where sensory neural hearing losses are permanent. Okay. It, then what is, uh, how is it generally diagnosed with you then if somebody comes in and is worried about it? So if they, um, depending on the age, mm-hmm. so if they're old enough, and I would say usually by four or five, they can if they you. can raise their hand when I play the beeps and we do <laughs> word testing and we do lots of other testing, there's different, there's lots of different devices and things we can use to cross check and um, make, sh- you know, double check things. Um, that would be the, the kind of the golden, golden standard of testing hearing loss um, or testing for hearing, a hearing mm-hmm. loss. Um, when they're younger than that, sometimes we will do what's called conditioned play audiometry. And so I'll sit in the sound booth with them and we'll play games and I'll, we'll be testing them as we're playing. So if you have like babies. A baby, then, then that's how? the next one we'll do. Yeah. And that's called an auditory brainstem response. And so what we do is we connect electrodes to their skin and then we play sound into the ear while they're sleeping. And we can test what the brainstem's response to sound is. And that gives us an estimation of what we call their threshold or where their hearing is at. Um, and so we can do that while the baby sleeps. If they're older and they can't sleep and we right. still need to do that test, um, then we can do that under sedation. And in Spearfish, we are the only one at West River that does sedated ABRs, is what they're called. Oh, excellent. And so we just started doing that within the last year. And there are other entities that can do auditory brainstem response testing while, like, a baby is sleeping in western South Dakota. But we're the, like I said, we're the only ones that do sedated okay. testing. And so that's a service that we were just started being able to provide so that um, families don't have to travel. Oh, for excellent. Like they were going to Sioux Falls. They were going to Denver. Um, and so, yeah, now we can do that right here at home. So. That's yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's what's so important anymore is to be able, to, that monument, you know, I've talked to uh, a lot of different doctors on this podcast that have said similar things to be like, well, we we have this here and we're the only one here and we're the, and that's got to give people so much comfort, you know, to know that this isn't going to cost me thousands of dollars to drive, to spend yeah. hotel, to stay, and you get to be at home and your yep. kids don't get disrupted and things like that. Um, well, a big part of, I'm assuming with hearing loss, especially with kids, is that hearing is so important when it comes to them developing speech and language. And so, um, you know, how does, how does uh, the hearing, well, again, don't want to say hearing loss, but how does a deafness in a child, um, how does that affect their language and, and their ability just to learn? I mean, it's, it's got to be much harder, right? Yes. Yeah, so we, um, I always kind of take what the family wants. So we, we discuss that when we talk about, okay, this is a diagnosis. This is the, the degree of hearing loss. Um, and then we talk about kind of what that family's hopes and wishes are for mm-hmm. their child. Sometimes that looks like uh, American Sign Language and just signing. Around here, that's probably the least um, option for that to be in isolation. Um, more so, we see a lot of total communication where we sign and we're, we're working on speech as well, um, along with device use, so hearing aids or cochlear implants. And then um, once we, we start to get them fit with those devices and they can start working on the input of language, then we also work with speech language pathologists to help a child develop that language skill further. Um, because we just know from lots of research, lots of data, that children with hearing, lo- with hearing loss need um, typically to work with a speech language pathologist to help develop those language skills. What else is affected in kids that um, may be born with those conditions or, or completely deaf? I mean, it's it's got to be, everything's got to be just a little bit harder. I mean, you what would else? Be, you would be surprised how you, you, hearing loss may be the only thing and you may not even notice. Really? They, you may not see their hearing aids you may not see their cochlear implants and you would have no idea that may be the only thing and they are vibrant children they have robust languages they're very intelligent um there's no holding these kids back well what um when it comes to uh let's say because we were talking a little bit before we started about 
uh, how you you know your what's inside your ears affects your balance and your ability to move. Does it affect these kids too at that young age in a, in a deafness like that, or is that a is that we a damage really. to something else? That's usually a damage to something else. We typically don't see it in children. Now there may be other things. There may be global delays mm-hmm. where that is affecting other body systems, and that may be why they're having difficulty with with other things. Um, but typically, hearing loss and isolation does not indicate that they're going to have trouble walking or that they're going to be behind in any other area. Okay. Um, besides potentially working more with that speech. Okay. Uh, well, we started talking about um, protection for the ears, which you <laughs> emphatically said that is the most important thing that uh, that kids should do. I mean, should it be from uh, any time they go into a loud environment, should they be protected at all? And what is, what's that threshold? Um, you know, because some parents, obviously, you have a kid, you want to make sure they're perfectly safe all the time, 100%. Um, but... You don't need to put ear protection on when you're going to the grocery store or right. to places like that, right? Right. So, so what would be the... Um, my husband would tell me I'm a total nerd, <laughs> but I carry on my cell phone and I have a noise meter on it. And yes. I will go into restaurants. I'll go into places and be like, this place is so noisy. Look how loud it is. And he just rolls his eyes. Um, but well, How's that, his hearing? Is exactly. Yeah. He tells me he has above average hearing, which well, that remains right. to be seen. Um, but that's one way you can check, and 80 decibels is what you're looking for, 80 to 85 decibels. Anything above that, we should be protecting the hearing, um, certainly if you're going to anything like the monster trucks, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then when you think about babies, if we're taking them to hockey games, things like that, that's just that's noisy. That's more than they probably need. Right. Um, protect that, those ears. And you can get ear, ear little earmuffs. And that's that's what you're looking for. Yeah, you do see anymore when you go to a lot of hockey games around here. Lots of parents are mm-hmm. are, are, are cognizant of that, yep. at least. Well, what do you think? Um, you know, for going going back to to listening to music or listening to podcasts like this mm-hmm. one. Um, I don't think we ever get that loud. Uh, what do you recommend? Do you prefer like in ear? Um, headphones I, or for anybody, I will tell them whatever you will wear, because really? if it's cumbersome, you're not going to do it. So if it's something where you have the over-the-ear headphones and that's easy and that's simple to put on, that's what you should use. If you have, if you buy the the roll-up foam and you're good about using them and you can get them into your ears deep enough where mm-hmm. they're actually helping, then that's fine. But a lot of people will tell me, "Oh, it's just I was just gonna do one thing, so I just I just didn't bother. Or I was right. just gonna do one shot, and so I just didn't bother." Well, that would have been easy to put the over the head on. Yeah. Um. And and that's the probably the easiest to use without um, because a lot of times when you roll up those foam earplugs, people don't put them in deep enough, and they're not actually getting the hearing protection that the packaging was was will be saying. The nice thing about those is you do you feel it the moment you know you have them in your ears correctly. Right. Yep. <laughs> you know, you um, can tell. I used to I used to sleep with them quite a bit just because mm-hmm. I I until I found white noise machines, which are great. <laughs> um yeah, there's you have to get them in, and then it it's it it feels euphoric yep. <laughs> once they're in there. And correctly. some people don't like the feeling of their ear being full. They oh, don't like that fullness, and so over it. the ear would be better. Yeah. Um, we do make custom earplugs, and so we make custom earplugs for noise, for hunting, for shooting, for um, swimming. What about like white noise for people that sleep for for noise at night? Is there ever a moment when you should just give your brain a rest from the noise or does that really does that matter just patient dependent if you like it that's fine okay as long as it's not really loud um i know with parents noise machines have become much more popular for helping their kids sleep Mm -hmm. and as long as they're further away from where the child sleeps so like on a nightstand or a table across the room and they're not too loud i say around 40 decibels is probably all the louder you need it for sleep oh okay uh, and when I'll, I'll kind of wrap up the this podcast with this one. When are, when are we going to cure uh, tinnitus or tinnitus? When are, when are we ever going to get that taken care of? Or is this whole is this whole podcast should warn you with your kids? You'll ne- they'll never get it if you if you listen to Doctor Beltman <laughs> and wear the headphones. It's noise induced hearing loss. Yes, uh, is very common to have tinnitus or tinnitus, however you want to say it, right. associated with it. So uh. protect your ears; you'll have less chance of the ringing in the ear. Right, but um, 
that's a hard one to come to get around. <sighs> I know. And the white it's, noise helps. It does. The distraction helps. Um, some people, that's kind of the first sign of a hearing loss a lot of times yeah. is the ringing in the ears. And so that's an indication that, hey, we should go have that looked at. <laughs> um, anytime you oh. have it, it can be an indication of things that are even more severe than that. So we always say, hey, if you have ringing in the ears, come, let's check it out. Let's look at it. So and what you're we saying can is go make, from there. make a doctor's appointment. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I have it that bad, but it's just when the room is totally quiet, you know, I, I can hear that. Yep. It's always worse than, always worse yeah, than quiet. Yeah. And, and this is just a, a lesson, kids. If you're ever going to go into a business that requires you to wear headphones most of the day, just turn them down a little bit. Turn them down and make them high quality. Yep. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, well, next time we talk, Dr. Beltman, uh, we're going to talk about um, some ways that, uh, that, that deafness can be repaired or fixed. Uh, hearing aids, uh, cochlear implants. Uh, I'm excited to have that conversation, too. So thank you very much for coming in, setting this all up, and we'll dive deeper next time. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.